So my sort of thinking was, let's find data about a gene or data about a, a disease from different perspectives. So the sort of ideas are, first of all, from the disease name, which is actually the, one of the tricky ones. Uh, we want to, how can we find the, found the mouse once we found the disease name? Uh, can we find information from the gene end, uh, from the phenotype end, and across species? So I'm just going to show you some little examples, really. Um, so this, uh, back to Jax. Um, so this is, I think, the place to start in terms of the mouse. Um, and what I'm going to look for is uh, that, non-insulin dependent diabetes mellitus. And that's the um, URL. So I've just put in NIDDM into the search box here. And I get back a set of genes, which is great. So that's very good. So that means that within MGI, there are direct links between diseases and mouse genes. And that's very useful, and that's based on OMIM. Um, so that's something that they, another thing that they've done very well, because often that won't work, and I'll show you some examples of why it won't work. So you can do that. And in fact, you can put many, probably nearly all disease terms into, into Jackson, get something back if, if there's anything in there. Um, of course, there are lots of genes, but then, hey. Um, so AKT2 is one of the ones that came up, so I've just picked out. So that you, as, as I showed you before, you get a, a whole page full of information about the gene. I showed you before the kinds of information that you can get out about the gene, so I'm, I'm not going to go into detail again. But um, for that gene, you have a set of associated diseases, uh, which is what comes up, and what you find is um, something. Uh, yeah, you get so you get NIDDN coming back up. So you know, basically that works. So you you can look at the you can put the, the disease term in. You can get the gene out, and the gene will come back with information about the disease. And you might actually find that it has other diseases associated with it too. So that's actually quite nice. So that's it's it's quite well done. Um, and what you would like to then be able to do is say, okay, so where can I get a mouse that's got an AKT two? Um, mutation of some kind in it. So what you would want to do, uh, what you can do is put AKT2 into the IMSR uh, page. So IMSR is actually, although the URL is, is quite different, it's called findmice.org, it's actually also run from the Jackson Lab. Unfortunately, it's not part of MGI, so it's not totally integrated. But nevertheless, it's, uh, it's the place, or a good place to look. It's not maybe the only place to look. In, as I said before, in theory, all of the large um, um, archiving uh, operations feed back into IMSR, plus some of the, the, the large mass clinics. So Harwell has a direct line into IMSR, amongst other things. So we put information about our released uh, lines into IMSR. So in principle, it should be pretty up to date. That doesn't mean everything's there. But nevertheless, it's a good place to start. So I've done that, and this is what I get. So I get a number of different um, alleles. Um, and what I'll get here is um, a description of the allele, and I will get a description of where that's available. So in this case, um, they're available for comp, so that's good. So there's knockouts, some Jacks, Jackson Labs that own um, um, alleles, uh, mostly ES cells, wherever they are. Um, from TIGM will be alleles, MMRC, which is the US uh, repository. So there's information about where you can get it, and you can just, um, I have to read it off, I can't remember. Um, and uh, you can order them more or less directly. Oh, well, you, are, you can either order them directly through IMSR, or you can go off to the uh, website and uh, get the information. And it also tells you the state. So, you know, these golden ones are ES cells. Um, there may be live mice, so you might want live mice. You may not want to wait for it. To, you may not want to make them yourself, so you can also choose to some extent. So it's, it's actually quite useful. But it is, um, it, is, it is run by one person, so it's not, you know, the most sophisticated operation in the world, but it does quite a lot. So let's try and do some other things. So an alternative to IMSR in Europe is EMMA. And if you put diabetes into the M into Emma, you will actually get a set of alleles back. So actually, that works. So Emma is quite well designed. 
uh, thanks to um, partly thanks to Damien Smedley, but thanks to many people who worked on the Emma website and, and database. So that's good. So you can actually, if you were in Europe, you could actually shortcut that and you could get, look at European Emma uh, lines and find diabetes-related uh, lines. Um, Harwell has its own version of this. Uh, this is a mouse book, which basically um, allows you to find out what lines are available at Harwell. Other, other sites have other solutions to the same problem. So you can also go to the individual uh, possible originators and look if you want to. Mousebrook's actually quite good and quite sophisticated, but they, they exist in different places. So again, um, you can put um, diabetes in. In this case, you'll find a, a set of um, Harwell lines, um, some of which you have to go to Emma to order, some of which aren't at the stage where they are in Emma, but they are available through Harwell. So that's always worth bearing in mind that sometimes mice haven't got to the repositories. <coughs> um, so we searched in IMSR for um, AKT2 and we found it and that was good. If we search IMSR for diabetes, it doesn't work. So we get all sorts of stuff. Uh, some of it's diabetes related, some of it isn't. And so this is where the limitations come. So it's not trivial to design a, a website that allows you to do all the searches you might want to do. And so if the investment is not there, which is the case for IMSR, it won't do diabetes. So you have to know what gene you want, or you have to think a bit more carefully about what you search for. Um, and and uh, I don't know, so, uh, yeah. So, and of course the point is that knockout mass has lots of good stuff. Um, and again, if you search for the gene, you'll find, you may find the, the, the ES cells or the mice there. So there's quite a lot of, 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 of access into mouse resources, either from MGI or through MGI products or, or through other products. And to some extent, um, it's worth having a look around in, in different places to find the mice you want. It's not always totally easy and transparent, even though uh, with the integration that's going on, at uh, knockoutmass.org, I think that will get easier and easier. And I wouldn't be surprised if that ended up being a, a more useful uh, a resource than IMSR eventually. So um, I'm not going to go through this again, but um, searching by phenotype as opposed to disease is, of course, a different issue, and you need to know what you're looking for. Um, and we've seen the MP already. Uh, and we've seen that it's uh, you know, useful for biologists. The main point, of course, is that it's, these are terms that you know, biologists easily understand. Um, and so uh, within MGI, you can search for mice, uh, or, or you can search for genes using the, the phenotype. And uh, the way they do it, which is also the way, a way that we've used in Neurophenome, is that they have the, um, the MP tree as a sort of search uh, framework. So um, you won't be able to read this, but I told you before, there are about 30 top level types of phenotype in the MP. And um, the way this works is you can click on one that, that, that's of interest. So here, um, I've clicked on homeostasis, which is reasonable. So I was talking about diabetes. And it opens, opens up another window, and uh, you can open up the whole string of the ontology terms and find something that's sufficiently detailed that means it's of interest to you. And what, it, what uh, the, uh, the website gives you, as, lo as well as the term that you might be interested in, it tells you how many alleles are associated with an abnormal phenotype of that kind. So you have a sort of a feeling for whether this is going to have give you lots of lots of stuff back, whether it's worth going further down to look for more detailed phenotypes, or whether there's not much there or indeed nothing. So that's quite useful too. And you come, you, what you do is you get back. Uh, um, so I was go, I was I was drilling down through homeostasis, and I I ended up with a set of alleles, uh, which. Are, when I clicked on uh, the, um, the ontology tree. And these are all impaired glucose tolerance alleles, so you can look and see what's there. Um, and it also gives you, as well as giving you what, it's, what, what these alleles show, it also tells you uh, 
you can click on that and see what, what the reference is so you can see what the paper was and whether you trust it and all this kind of thing, which is also useful. So that's pretty good. Um, we've heard about Eumodic. And uh, one point that um, we sort of tend to gloss over but is that Eumodic uh, and hopefully IM, IMPC in the future, uh, it, it agglomerates data from a number of different mouse clinics. So there are, in, in Eumodic, there are four mouse clinics doing the phenotyping. Um, there's, there's Sanger, Harwell, um, um, Munich, and Strasbourg. And we've had to do a lot of engineering to make sure that when these centers send us the data, it's all in a standard format, so we know what it's all about. You don't want to know about that. But it is uh, quite carefully thought about. And in the process, we've, made, we've designed systems that annotate um, the, um, the lines with ontology terms. So we've actually done quite a lot of work in thinking about how to annotate phenotype data. Uh, this is the Europhenome, the latest version of the Europhenome website. And uh, this is really, so the difference between this data and the data that's in MGI is that this is raw data, raw phenotype data about individual mass knockouts. So that's not in MGI. There will be a, a representation of this at some point, but at the moment that's not in MGI. So this is actually a separate resource. And, and of course these lines are directly related to the, to the IKMC and um, UCOM lines. So there's a close link between um, Umodic and, uh, and uh, UCOM. Um, and you're actually able to access the UCOM ordering system through uh, Eurofino. Uh, but nevertheless, the con some of the concepts for um, labeling the data are similar. So we have also in uh, Eurofino, we have the concept of the uh, ontology tree. So this is, again, the MP. So it's the same ontology. And um, you can go and pick something I've actually picked as well. There it is. So here we've got um, genes because in uh, eumodic, you only have one representation of it. Well, not always. You basically have one or maybe two representations of a particular gene. You have a formal allele name. Um, and then you have the observation, which is decreased circulating glucose level. Um, and what's, this is inferred, actually. These, so these, these annotations are inferred from the data. So what happens is that we take the data on individual lines, we compare it with baseline mice, and we say, okay, that's high, significantly high. And I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and so the actual, what's happened is that there's been a procedure, an SOP, as uh, we, we heard about SOP yesterday, uh, fasted clinical chemistry. Um, and that what's been measured in that SOP is glucose, and what we find is decreased circulating glucose. So that's a, you know, a result, an annotation. And we can, if you want to see the data, you can click on graph and you can see the data. So that's the way we've organized the data in Neurofino. And that, of course, is much more data-oriented than what is in the MGI, which is, um, which is um, annota just annotated data. Um, something different in uh, Neurofino is what we've called Phenomap. And Phenomap is, um, for anyone who's, uh, who's familiar with uh, heat maps in microarray or transcriptomics analysis will get the idea of what a Phenomap is. So basically, um, we used to have this in red and green, but of course, color blindness means we have to change that. Um, but basically, uh, this is a bit of a sparse area of the graph, but if there's a blue box then the, uh, that particular allele is normal for that phenotype. If there's a red box, then that particular allele is abnormal in that particular part of the phenotyping pipeline. So AKT2, for example, we have a number of abnormalities. We have an abnormality in body weight, in DEXA, so that's uh, bone density. And uh, when it's homozygous, which is the lower one, we've, you can see the faster clinical chemistry result and a few other things. So you can immediately pick up, you can look for your gene and pick up where you see un, uh, abnormal types. And that's, uh, we think, quite a nice um, sort of visual guide. And, uh, you know, particularly where, you know, traditionally people have, have been interested in one particular phenotype. They will look at their gene and say, oh, well, actually there's other stuff there. Maybe that's interesting or maybe there are other ways around. So that's, that's the, one of the aims of this uh, representation. And 
as I said, the, um, the annotation is done computationally. So um, what we've, we've done, we've set two different things. We have set um, a, a, a p value, so how unlikely is that result by chance? We also set an effect size. Zero means anything, but, oops. but uh, it, you can set an effect size, so it can be two standard deviations, three standard deviations. So you can choose, because what, what you sometimes see in this data is that you can get very significant differences which are very small. And people may not be interested in small differences even though they're very significant. So we need to allow people to uh, restrict what they see. And obviously, the, the more stringent uh, you set those, those parameters, the less you see. So you, you obviously want to play with that. But we think this is quite a, a nice representation. So that's Eurofino. Um, another database which I mentioned earlier, probably the first thing, was MPD. So this is the mouse phenome, phenome database. And this is another database that's run at uh, the Jackson Lab. And in, in some ways, it's quite s similar in concept to Europhenome. But what this is is um, the phenotypes of inbred strains. So it's not mutant strains. It's inbred lines. Um, so there's a distinction. Um, it has to be said there are some quite nice tools in MPD that we don't have in Europhenome um, for looking at, for example, ranking lines, which are the most abnormal, you know, which have the most extreme values for this and that and the other, and various analyses that you can do. Which, are, which is quite nice. Um, and here, for example, you click on blood. So here you've got a, what we would consider to be an SOP in Europhenome um, blood chemistry. You click on the thing you're interested in, and you go in the way and look at the data. And you get quite a nice, well, it's maybe a bit, bit rich, but busy, but uh, you get quite a lot of data back. Um, and you can see, um, you know, um, yeah, various. Um, descriptions for, for different different lines or whatever. So that it's quite good, actually. This is actually Eumorphia data. So this is data from the Eumorphia project, which preceded Eumodic characterized um, um, a couple of lines, and so, or two or three lines. So this is actually data that came from Eumorphia. So MPD is somewhere where to look if you want to find out about inbred lines, what their particular phenotypes might be, uh, if you want to find an inbred line that's got a fin type that may be of use to you, that's that's where you should go. So, how extended is this pipeline? It's not a pipeline. So what they do, they 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 they, they have a set of um, of lines, and they they ask people to sign up, and to perform a, a set a set of tests or a test on up at least I can't remember what the minimum number is at least fifteen lines. So it's not very consistent. I mean, the, the, the phenotyping is consistent, but the lines that have the data are not necessarily consistent. So you may or may not get data for a particular line. So, and, it's, and it's done you know, when people, when labs are able or willing to do it, they do it. So it's, it's not in the same, it's not, it's not a factory like, like Emotic, but it, it, it produces data. So it's yeah, interesting. So as I said, there are issues with searching by phenotype. So it's good to be able to use the ontology tree. Um, if you're, you're using text terms, then you have to be aware that that term might not be in the database, and you may have to fiddle around with it and choose new ones. Um, and it may well be that the, the phenotype hasn't been measured. Um, so you have to be um, a bit cautious. One way, <laughs> or another way, in, is to use OMIM itself. So uh, we've seen using disease terms. Um, you can actually, so, so um, MGI actually, because it uses OMIM as a source of terms, actually allows you to click on OMIM terms. So to remind you, OMIM is the online Mendelian inheritance, inheritance in man. So it describes um, all of the, well, pretty well all of the Mendelian traits and disease traits in humans. So you can have... I mean, this is not the best way to represent a long list of text terms, but nevertheless, so here you have starting with A and working your way through, and you can click on what you want. Um, but you can also type something in. If you type something in, it may not be there. But anyway, it's there. And so you can find, you know, you can click on diabetes mellitus, and you'll get back the same search, basically, as we got at the beginning. So it works that way, too. Uh, it's, it's not ontology, but it works pretty well. 
And if you don't know what the right term is for your disease, this may well be a good way to, to, to go in. And we have actually just recently um, introduced something a bit similar in Eurofino, although this uses, um, uses gene mapping, so it doesn't use term mapping. Um, term mapping is beyond what we can, can't, we can't do it yet. But uh, what this does basically is it, it takes, oops, sorry, takes uh, disease associations in humans, maps them back into the Eurofenome data set and says, okay, um, I've got genes which are associated with diseases in humans. Here they are in Eurofenome. This is what the results are, which is, you know, you may use them. And you can either search by human gene. Generally speaking, human genes and mouse genes have very, very similar names. They, in theory, they should, be virtually, they should be the same, but they're not always. Or put a term in. So finally, uh, I just wanted to point out a few other st things, a few other databases which might be of interest. Um, so phenomic, oops, sorry, phenomic DB is an attempt to link phenotypes and diseases across species, but it only uses text, text mining, so it's not perfect. But what it does do is it has data from not only humans and mice, but Drosophila, C. elegans, yeast, you know, as much as they could find. Um, and so it's definitely worth having a look at to see whether you can find interesting information because you might find interesting information about a gene which has a phenotype in Drosophila which might give you a hint. So there's nothing systematic about it but it's potentially quite useful. So here um, is a search for um, diabetes and you know it, it picks things up and that's because a lot of this description, this is from OMIM so there's a textual description, it just searches text. So it's pulled in information about genes from OMIM, puts it into the database, searches the text, it finds diabetes. So that's superficial, but it works. Who um, so does it? Uh, forgotten that. It's a group in Germany. I've forgotten his name now, actually, offhand. Um, they have trouble funding it, but uh, it, it's, uh, in principle, it's a good idea. And, yeah, more. So there is actually quite a lot out there and you can get quite a lot of information. What we would like to do is make it better, uh, obviously. Um, so we, we have taken to um, automatic annotation, for example, of raw data. I think when IMPC takes play, uh, you know, is established, that's bound to be the way that we, we annotate our, our um, phenotype data sets because we can't have people going through them all and um, deciding. What's a, what's a good what's a good phenotype? What's not a good phenotype? Particularly as people are subjective. So if we what we will probably do is have an objective measure, and I think we'll probably have I mean I'm guessing some way of feeding back into the system that people say oh no actually this has got a phenotype even though you haven't found it. Um, as I said before, links between mass phenotype and human phenotype and disease are very poor. We need to work on that. And there's another issue, what's a model? So my mouse has a couple of phenotypes which look a bit like this disease. Is it a model for that disease? Is it a model for those phenotypes, which is more reasonable? Because people want models of disease. Do they exist at all? It's a concept. So that's a, another thing we can argue about sometime. So I, we, last year, I, I sort of, I, we haven't quite got the, the, the time for feedback this year, but last year, we sort of sent the students away to go and look up stuff about their disease genes. And I think it's still a good exercise. So if you guys, you have got the access to the computer room, so it might be worth doing just going away, looking through some of these data, uh, these websites. The, uh, have they got the CD yet? Yeah, have they got this? Yeah. So, so the, the URLs are on the CD. Yeah, yeah. So you can look at that. So. Yeah, so, that, so you, know, there's, you don't have to do it here. You can do it when you go home. But it's worth, I think, just trying it out to sort of see what you can find. And you might be surprised what you can find. There's maybe more than you think there is. And there's some links, actually, so you can, you can write those down if you want to. I'll come back to that in a second. Systems biology. <laughs> I have got 10 minutes, so I'll go and talk about systems biology. I just wanted to say <laughs> that um, uh, so it's some good stories and some, there's a couple, there's a, there's a maybe a, a not great story and maybe some better stuff. I just wanted to give a, um, a feel for what we've been trying to do um, in this area. 
So um, our first experience with, with, with systems biology was actually very, very conventional. And we, we, were, we wanted to build a um, what's known as ODE, so Ordinary Differential Equation Model of some biochemistry. So I was working with Roger, who's disappeared, uh, on his um, diabetes models. And we thought it would be useful to have a model of, um, ideally, of insulin secretion. In, you know, so how, does, how, does, how do beta cells respond to uh, glucose concentration and vary their insulin secretion as a, in response? Now, so the first lesson, a number of lessons, um, is that um, the data is not out there. So what, what Glauco was saying about, you know, if you want to build a model to explain some system, you need to have a lot of knowledge in, in it. You need, enough, you need all the knowledge. And in, no, no. well, a lot, of, a lot of knowledge, sufficient knowledge for whatever you want to do. So there is sufficient knowledge uh, to model um, f um, the response of beta cells to glu glucose and the, the change in ATP concentration. So in beta cells, insulin secretion is, is a, reflects the change in ATP concentration in the cell. So we could model the change in ATP concentration in response to glucose. And we could do that in a moderately reasonable looking way. So we were quite pleased with that. Um, but you can see this is quite a complex um, network. Um, on the, you can also see that this is, you know, biochemistry 101. This is gly glycolysis, TCA, TCA cycle oxidative phosphorylation. Um, and, well, okay, you can get realistic results, but actually these systems, the, even these really, really well-known well pathways are not well characterized. So you, 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 you don't get a set of parameters that you can build a model accurately with because they don't exist. So this, and this is, as I say, is biochemistry 101. Um, so it's, it's almost, until the world changes, it's, it's, it's never going to be possible to build a totally biologically realistic model of even this biochemistry because we just don't have the, the, the measurements. And part of that is because although people have studied glycolysis for a long time, They've worked in different systems. They've worked under different conditions. They've worked in different species. So they've never put together a consistent data set. There may be a consistent data set in yeast, but that's no use in mass or marginally. So there are problems with that. A lot of that doesn't appear to matter in the sense that we put in um, parameters from all sorts of species, and the system works in the sense that we got what we wanted to get. We got ATP concentration going up as we put glucose in more glucose in. And one of the lessons of, in systems biology seems to be that the wiring is more important than the values. So how you connect things together is possibly the most important thing in biology, and the parameters are fine-tuning. But there are parameters in here that would screw the whole thing up, so it's not 100% true. So we've learnt a bit about what you can do using this approach, but it's clear that if you want to build a cell model, um, you don't understand the wiring because you don't know how most proteins interact with each other. Um, and you certainly don't have hardly any of the parameters. So it's going to have to be quite superficial if you build a, try and build a cell model. You're never going to, at the moment, be in a position to build a detailed cell model. That's one thing. This is more recent work, and this is where we've been trying to make use of the ontologies um, to um, learn more about phenotypes. So, as I said, the MGI has a lot of data in it, and you can download the data. And what you can download, and this is very simple-minded, but this is what we did. Um, you can download gene phenotype association. So you can have, for each gene, what phenotype ontology terms are associated with those genes. And using those, those, that combination, you could build a, net, a network. And this is a network that's been built, that's built by Octavio, who is a PhD student of mine who's just finished. And um, what you find is that you, um, there's, a, there's a mathematical description of something called a community, a gene community, which is quite a stringent definition of genes which interact with each other much more frequently than the surrounding genes do. 
Um, and the, the, the color mapping is basically the, is, well, the color mapping is actually the phenotypes, but you can see that these, these communities, which are communities, have, many of them have quite distinct phenotypes. So there are groups of genes which are you know, collectively associated with particular phenotype terms. Um, not all of them. So um, I'll go backwards and forwards. So, for, anyway. so this is a, a heat map as well, but this is a different kind of heat map. This is phenotype terms and communities. And so what this shows is which communities have phenotype terms strongly associated. So the ones with yellow boxes are strongly associated with phenotype terms. And you can see that some of them have quite strong associations, but other ones have weak associations. And actually, if the resolution or the, the color resolution was better, many of these communities have a number of phenotypes. So this means that phenotypes, some phenotypes are strongly associated with gene sets. Other phenotypes are not strongly associated with gene sets. And equally, you also have pleiotropy. So you have um, um, gene sets which have a number of phenotypes. So um, this is a picture of phenotype space, in a sense. Um, uh, and there are the, the more diffuse phenotypes are things like body weight or growth, some body size, these things which are affected by many, many you know, other genes and by many environmental effects. Um, and there were, interestingly, we also looked at um, the most connected genes in these communities. And we found that they tend to be transcription factors. So there, there are probably transcription factors which regulate phenotypes. And we haven't looked at that in detail yet, but it, that's also very interesting, I think. And this is a paper we've just, uh, I think, almost got submitted, uh, got accepted. And the last one was just trying, uh, was trying to do this link. So how can we link between um, phenotypes and diseases? Well, we can't do it semantically. Can we do it using genes? And so we just experimented trying to link um, diseases to, to phenotypes. So we sort of built a little neural network and basically what we have is individual diseases which may be linked to more than one gene, um, which may be linked to more than one MP term. When we said, can we recover, um, what, can we recover a set of MP terms that are associated with a particular gene, and can we re recover a disease that may be associated with a set of MP terms? And so this is sort of one, a good example, of a good result, if you like. So on the left-hand side, we have I put, I put, we put diabetes in, into the system. We got a list of terms back on the left-hand side, which are the most the highly, most highly scoring um, MP terms that are associated with diabetes-related genes, and they seem to be mostly reasonable-looking uh, terms. And when we put the top ten MP terms back in, we get diabetes out. So we've got a system there we can possibly exploit to start doing some analysis, my main interest in this is, is actually uh, uh, finding MP terms that associate with genes, but there are other uses, and it may be, end up as a tool in the Europhenome as well. So, so, so this is not conventional systems biology, but it is using networks and it's using gene interactions to do things, which I think is potentially of interest. So, um, Systems approaches may be valuable, but they need to be evaluated carefully. Good. And models can only represent current knowledge, but they may tell us new things. Very good. So I thought you'd like that. <laughs> and I'll, put, I'll go back to the links so you can look at the links again. <laughs>